Hey, good morning, everybody. Come on in out there. We've got plenty of seats. Uh, sorry, we're getting started a little late. I wanted to make sure that everybody had an opportunity to come as those sessions were uh, finishing up. So, uh, but we've been told we can run late. Uh, so if, uh, if, we, if it gets late in the hour and you get hungry and your stomach's growling, don't be afraid to just step up and leave, but you're welcome to stay. Um, any questions we don't, we'll, we'll probably, if you have a burning desire to ask a question during a talk, you know, don't be afraid to, but otherwise you can just wait till the end of that talk. There'll be three speakers and then at the end of that, we'll take questions. Um, and then um, if there's still time at the very end, if you, you guys have any other questions you want to ask the speakers before we leave, you're more than welcome to. My name's Dan Glenn. I'll be your moderator. I'll introduce uh, our, our wonderful group of speakers today. Um, the first is uh, Bruce Johnson. And one of the reasons that I, um, that I actually volunteer for this session is because Bruce and I had the opportunity to do Ranching for Profit. So I got to meet Bruce a couple years back in Georgia uh, and developed a relationship with him. And, um, we had a little subgroup and uh, we were doing a lot of the same things as well. So I look forward to hearing from everybody today, but our first speaker is gonna be Bruce Johnson. He's the owner of Dragonfly Farms in Lu Louisa? Louisa, yeah. Louisa County, Virginia, producing direct market grass finished beef, lamb, pastured pork, chicken and eggs using regenerative grazing practices. Um, they do this on about 300 acre farm and 260 acres of leased pasture. Beef is the centerpiece, and this is the 14th year in business. Um, producing well-finished, excellent grass-finished beef is their goal to show that the values and practices um, that they implement can economically support the business of the family while improving the land and contribute to the community. So without further ado. <clears throat> okay, how's everyone doing? Good. Here's that. And that should be that. And I'm excited to be here. I appreciate the opportunity. And I really like what I'm talking about. I get excited about genetics and grass and beef with fat on it. and. Um, then I don't get off the farm much and I get nervous in front of a group of people. And so <laughs> I do like what I'm talking about and I'll probably get nervous. I'm gonna read from what I got here and uh, <laughs> that's the best I got at the moment. But I'm happy to take questions also. So, um, so my name is Bruce Johnson and um, I own Dragonfly Farms in Louisa, Virginia. It's about roughly halfway between Richmond and Charlottesville. We've been grass finishing beef and direct marketing it since 2007. We have also been producing lamb since early in our business and recently added pork, but beef has been our centerpiece and main focus and that's what I'm gonna speak about today. Um, I didn't grow up, I didn't grow up on a farm and was even a vegetarian for years I worked in greenhouses, gardens, nurseries, and landscaping until I met my wife, who happens to be a veterinarian in the back of the earth, two great kids. Um, <clears throat> we bought a 50-acre farm together in 2007. We bought four of the belted Galway that were on the farm, and we started our herd. Um, about four, almost five years ago in 2017, we moved to a bigger farm, one county over in Louisa. Uh, today we're grazing 670 acres on owned and leased land um, <clears throat> and finishing 50 steers a year, selling all of it, mostly retail, some wholesale to local stores and butchers. Some of this grazing land is new to us and we're going to continue to increase production, selling more finished animals and selling wean steers and commercial females. Uh, there are great speakers at this conference that can speak of the benefits of grass-fed beef, the benefits of soil health, pasture management, etc. So I'd like to speak on what finishing beef um, with regenerative practices means to me and what it looks like on our farm. I spend a lot of time speaking with customers uh, on the phone, on our farm, and at, at a farmer's market. I describe our beef as regenerative, grass-fed, and grass-finished. 
they hear, customers hear some other folks selling beef. We have a lot of uh, direct market beef producers in the area. And they hear other folks selling beef saying, all cattle eat grass. That's true, but that's not what I mean by grass-fed. And some folks say, our steers have only had grass. And that is true, but that's not what I mean by grass-finished. Um, our beef is truly grass-finished, fat on grass alone. And for us, that looks like a 24-month-old, give or take, steer or heifer, that gives us a hanging weight of 650 pounds, give or take, and has great flavor, uh, fat cover, and internal marbling. Uh, I believe properly finished beef on grass alone using regenerative practices is really a special product with many benefits. <clears throat> and customers come to us and buy our beef um, with different priorities and interests and concerns. Uh, some of our customers are concerned about the environmental impacts of our farm and our cattle. Some of our customers want to buy directly from a farm to support a local business. Some of our customers want to know about animal welfare, a humane life and death for the animals. Some customers want to know about soil health and carbon sequestration. Some customers are concerned about the human nutrition and they want grass-fed meat. <clears throat> um, we can address all of these concerns by explaining our practices. Regardless of people's priorities or concerns, all of our customers want to enjoy the meal they sit down to share with their loved ones. And I believe that's why properly finished grass-fed beef is so important. <clears throat> so how do we finish our beef? <clears throat> Genetics, uh, animal husbandry, and grazing management. It's very important to us to have calm cattle uh, we call them to fresh grass. They don't run from us. When we have to work our herd or load animals, it's not wild or rowdy. We don't need many people helping us, and everyone must help keep the cattle from getting worked up. In addition to these low-stress practices, we also cull for bad feet. We don't, we don't deal with trimming. We stopped deworming our calves several years ago, and we have not noticed any decrease in weaning or finish weight and we believe this is healthier for the soil. We offer a free choice loose mineral blend with kelp. We vaccinate our calves at weaning with one booster shot two to three weeks after. We do not vaccinate our beef animals after weaning and the cow herd is vaccinated annually prior to calving. We banned and ear tag our calves on day one. We don't use insecticides or growth hormones. For the genetics, um, selecting the type of cattle that will work best in my program and on our farm is very important. We've bought cattle primarily um, for the breeding stock, primarily from four breeders to build our herd <clears throat> and improve our genetics. For us in Central Virginia, what has been accessible is some really great grass genetics that happen to be mostly black Angus. We've switched recently to red Angus bulls for the last two years. <clears throat> when I go to look at a breeding stock to purchase, I wanna see smaller framed animal that is successfully thriving on grass alone. I wanna see animals that have a slick coat, a good body condition, high fertility rate, and calm nature. The farm that I purchase animals from needs to have a good looking calf crop that is not being supplemented with grain. Cows that are nursing should be in decent body condition. I believe this inherent good body condition relates to good fertility and fleshy steers that finish well on grass. Um, I just, again, I really think that an animal that holds his weight easily is the biggest key to what, what we want. Uh, in our own herd, we're selecting our replacement heifers on early maturity and fertility, those that breed to calve at two years old. We cull open animals and animals that wean small calves. We're constantly selecting to improve our herd and pr produce beef animals that will finish on forage. Our breeding females are 1,100 to 1,200 pound cows with a smaller frame, 
Also, again, temperament is super important. We need calm cattle for safety so that they're not infuriating. And I believe calm cattle will gain weight better and taste better. We call cows that are open, that have bad temperament, or that can't hold their weight. So here's just some of the bulls we've used. We bought um, Cedric here uh, maybe 10 years ago. We used him for four or five years. We kept a lot of heifers out of them, and they are wonderful cows today. Um, I sold him to a friend, and he kept breeding uh, some animals, some cows for my friend. Uh, Cedric worked until 10 years old at least, and um, he didn't fault. Uh, my buddy was just didn't want to gamble for the age of that bull at that point. Um, we then switched to, we called him Kiwi, is a son of the um, Pine Bank 4197, uh, bred in Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, excuse me. And this bull was amazing and uh, was just always fat and um, looked great. Um, all of our bulls have just been um, docile, easy to work with. We're not, they're definitely bulls, but we're not scared of them. There's no, they're very calm and easy to work with. Um, <clears throat> he helped increase our um, carcass weight and the calves look great. We've kept a lot of females from him. Uh, we then went to um, a bull, um, is really, uh, he's a grandson of a 1960s Y bull. And um, a breeder in Northern Virginia found some semen in the freezer that people have been holding on to, obviously, for quite a while. And he bred a really nice bull out of him. This is a son out of that bull. Uh, Cole was really well built, held his weight well. Great looking confirmation in bull. Um, he seemed to size up just slower than we wanted. Uh, at three years old, he looked great. He wasn't quite as big as we were hoping for. I've always had a herd that's been on the smaller side thinking that's gonna be good for grass finishing. So I didn't, I, I was at a point where I didn't want him to go too small. I needed to keep some size on the herd. So we kept him for about three years. His calves are looking great. You know, he's a really good bull. That's another picture of him. And here's uh, one of the bulls we've gone to uh, out of Kentucky. Um, we call him Sparky. Who gets to name the bull? <laughs> Kids are a big help. <laughs> Everything gets a name. Uh, rams and bulls and some of the cows. Uh, so we're real excited about this bull, and we've got a yearling bull from the same herd, and uh, the two of them are working together. We're breeding about 60, 65 cows in the fall herd. Uh, here's one of our cows. Uh, she's probably eight years old in that picture. Uh, really deep bodied, holds her weight well, 1,200 pounds. Um, it raises a good calf. Um, Is that Johnson grass? This, there's some gamma, that's Johnson grass in the front, absolutely. Uh, she is in a gamma grass field, the farm we rent, uh, where the cows are has some interesting history and there's a 20 acres of gamma grass, 20 acres of switchgrass, and because it was abandoned and kind of zero input haymaking for years, there's a whole lot of Johnson grass. And uh, with management, I like it. Uh, here's some pretty pictures from, these are all, all these pictures are from our herd, our farm, and, um, but we had a photog photographer take these pictures. Nice slick steers on uh, summer grazing, and um, they're probably a month or two away from butcher. Um, so our grazing management is another big focus for producing top quality grass finished beef. Um, our finishing animals are on our home farm and the cow-calf herd is across the street on a leased farm. Having the beef animals separated allows us to more intensively manage them and keep them on our most nutritious pastures. We'll sometimes pull out the few animals going for butcher within the next 30 to 60 days and graze them ahead of the rest of the beef herd. 
to give them the most nutritious grasses. Uh, most of our farm is in cool season perennials. Central Virginia works well. Um, our home farm we bought, it was in soybeans when we bought it, and so we started with a clean slate. We put it in Max-Q fescue, orchard grass, and Ladina clover. Um, at that farm, we have a 20-acre field dedicated to growing annuals. And on all of our ground, we have 60 acres in native warm season perennials. Um, we also have some fields that are super diverse, like the uh, zero input hay production from the past. They're almost wild with Johnson grass, all kinds of weeds, um, annual grasses. And with management, there's a lot of nutrition um, for the cattle. Lots of wildlife habitat and the diversity in the diet. Um, there's a whole lot of summer grazing allows us for some stockpiling of some other fields, especially any fields with K Kentucky 31 type fescue for winter grazing. From a cattle nutrition viewpoint, our steers need to have great quality forage in front of them always and plenty of it. Our cow herd is also on good quality pastures, helping them stay healthy, fertile, and raising strong calves. We leave the calves with the mamas until 10 months, which we think gets the calves off to a great start. From a soil and environmental viewpoint, we use cross fencing and temporary electric fencing to bunch the cattle and, and keep them moving. It depends on many things as to how tight we have the herd and how quickly we're moving them, time of year, rate of grass growth, the pasture's history, does it need to be grazed a little harder than normal or maybe be extra gentle to it, weeds, undesirable species present, type of cattle and their nutritional needs, young stockers or fat steers, dry cows or cows going on into the breeding season or early, early lactation. We do feed some hay, some winters, maybe 90 days, um, and sometimes we give our finishing steers a little bit of good grass hay while they're grazing lush, nutritious pastures, early spring, um, wet fall. Uh, sometimes we give them a little alfalfa if they're on good but not great pastures. The goal is to keep the beef animals always gaining on a constant upward plane of nutrition. This means we plan ahead, stockpile winter grazing, and make sure we have enough high quality hay to feed during the winter months. If we feel like we're going to have a lull in gaining, which can happen sometimes for us with the winter cold and mud, we take a break from butchering during the months of February and March uh, until we get the cattle gaining again and ready for butcher. We want to rest the pastures to recover before the cattle return to graze again. So this can be 30 days rest, 120 days rest, whatever it takes, time of year, pasture, etc. So here's a, this happens to be a summer stockpile. It's one of the wilder fields, but um, with managing and bringing them in right, <clears throat> there's brome grass and Johnson grass and um, crown vetch. Um, lots of just kind of wild stuff, but I think when it's, when it's younger, when it's at the right stage, there's a lot of nutrition there. This is the cow herd. So have you built a Galloway's made, made the cut? Uh, uh, we have a couple purebred Belties still. We have some 50-50 uh, Angus Belty cows that are really good cows, and they've given me no reason to let them go. So uh, this is at our farm. This is uh, we planted 20 acres here in um, big blue stem, little blue stem Indian grass uh, mixture, and. Uh, this is a recent picture, late summer, early fall. We did not, we could have taken one more grazing. We didn't this year. Um, I thought letting it, letting it go to seed would be good and um, we'll probably burn it in March. We haven't done that yet, but um, I'm gonna talk to JB about a couple of those items. Um, this is a cool season annual mix. It's mostly oats and barley, crimson clover, and some red clover. We planted that in fall, and uh, sometimes we'll get a little fall or winter grazing, but um, great grazing in spring. We've planted some, um, this one I think is a 10 or 12 species mixture of summer annuals, um, a Sudan hybrid, Sudan uh, sorghum hybrid, uh, millets, 
um, maybe a sterile corn, a grazing corn, uh, cow peas, um, buckwheat, sunflower, sun hemp, and uh, great diversity. And I can almost watch the cows' steers getting fatter out there. Um, we have our cattle fenced out of all creeks and ponds on the farm. They're, make, they're drinking from automatic waters, carrying well water. We keep in mind wildlife when we make decisions about grazing or mowing to encourage wildlife habitat. We're seeing quail, turkey, big healthy deer, and bear. We had a wildlife biologist come and do a survey of all the species he saw in a day. He saw many indicator species for a healthy environment. And here's a list of the birds, dragonflies, and butterflies he found in a partial day of walking the pastures. So butchering, how do I know when an animal is ready? When I'm walking through the herd trying to determine which animal is headed for the butcher next. I want to pick an animal that has fat accumulating at the tail head and the brisket. I want an animal that is thick through the hind end with an overall fullness. I should not see ribs or hooks and pins on the pelvis. No backbone should be visible. I want an animal that is proportionate in a way that would tell me the animal is done growing taller. What I mean is that the animal should not look leggy or butt high. Once they're done growing taller, that's when they'll truly fill out. For us, this can be anywhere from 20 months to 36 months. Uh, we try to be patient and take the steers when they're ready for the butcher, not just when we have a date to fill. Uh, word of mouth advertising and repeat customers are crucial and will only happen if I keep quality of beef a priority. Um, so then marketing, now that I have an amazing product, what do I do with it? Providing a truly finished grass-fed beef product using regenerative grazing practices is a rare and specialized good. I need to get the best price for my work. <clears throat> I started by direct marketing, telling my farm story, let my customers know what I'm doing by having a nice website, informative handouts, sitting at the farmer's market for years and meeting customers. I'm now wholesaling some and selling more quarters, halves, and wholes to families and not going to farmer's market as much. Um, so we also, I forgot to mention, we, our beef is dry aged at the slaughterhouse. And then something interesting we're doing, we're in the process of it at the moment, and I, th I think she said it's gonna be six or eight months till we see results, but um, the Bionutrient Institute, which is part of the Bio Nutrient Food Association out of Massachusetts is doing a food nutrient density study and they're starting with beef. And um, so we knew, I've got three steers going to the butcher today. Hopefully they're loading fine as we speak. And um, <clears throat> so I knew which field they'd be grazing before they went to the butcher. I took uh, soil samples and forage samples. Um, and then Monday before we drove down here, we took manure samples because the steers have been there on that field rotating through it for a week. Um, and then three weeks from now, when the beef comes back, dry aged, cut, wrapped, we're gonna send a ribeye from each of those three steers to these labs also. So they're gonna have all of that to look at the nutritional content of beef and what factors lead up to it. So. I know. <laughs> Hopefully they enjoy it. Um, so here's the contact info, and I'd be happy to answer any questions and, or catch me after the talk. Steers are going to the butcher, I'd say an average of 24 months old. Definitely some at 20 months. Sometimes some at 36 months. Um, how do you get them at 36 months? How do you get them through USDA? Our, our USDA slaughter facility takes them. They pull the backbone. So there's, um, and there's no extra fee at ours. So you put them in the backbone store? That's right. They, they call it a red tag. They red tag it. And um, we'll get New York strips and fillets, no T-bones and porterhouse. Yeah. So are you slaughtering year round? Close to year round. Okay. Yep. Are you calving in different seasons, or do you have a controlled breeding season, or how does that work? We definitely control the breeding season. Um, the majority, 
Two thirds or more are September calving into October. Um, with our genetics still not being super tight, we have some that finish early, we have some that finish late, and then we do some spring calving. And have you found that there is a specific time for your farm that your cattle tend to finish earliest, best, meaning is, is my September calf going to be ideal because my board has changed? Or you know, do you find that any of your spring calves do better? I'm just curious to see what you've seen. Yeah, I, I think those September calves, you know, the weather and the grass and really my management, if it all comes together, um, um, we're, we're taking some 20, 22-month-old calves that were born in September. Yeah, they're looking great. They're looking great, yeah. And then, like, what factors are you looking at visually when you're deciding? Like, is it, you know, laying out a cat on the slip-up, like, yes. all those things? Like, how are you choosing them on? Besides just, like, they look the biggest, right? Right. Oh, yeah. And they're not always the biggest ones that go. Sometimes it's definitely the fat and the finish. And so the rib, just the overall plumpness, kind of softness, I can just see the fat on the whole animal. Uh, look at the tail head a lot, it's a good indicator. And, um, and the brisket. Yeah. I don't, I don't. I trust the breeders and I, and I don't work with many of, you know, I'm not buying from random people. They come with a good reputation from people that I like, but it's, but I'm there looking at them and uh, I see how they manage the cows. I see the calves. I see, I look at what they're doing and how they're treating the animals and how that bull looks coming out of that environment. And I don't travel far to get them. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then where it comes from is very important too. Mm -hmm. I mean, environment, environmentally, I'm on the Gulf Coast, so he has to, uh, can't be from too far off. Sure. He, he won't make it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes nine months, but yeah, 10 months, and the cows just hold their weight. And, um, you know, they might get too fat if I wean those calves early. And so there's no need to wean them early. We got plenty of grass there, and um, they're not drinking a lot of milk at that age anyway, but um, probably a little bit. And it, it just works well with their whole schedule. We don't put them on uh, scales for live weights too often, but um, we're definitely getting 600, 650. We've gotten a 700 pound hanging weight, which isn't big by feedlot standards at all, but, but we're getting great fat content and it's marbled and um, we're happy with it. Do you have them graded or No, this slaughter facility doesn't grade choice, prime, et cetera. Uh, Um, like total head, cows, calves, yearlings, etc., cetera, is um, over 200 currently. And um, we're purchasing the neighbor's farm and his herd. And um, they aren't quite the genetics that I'm looking for, but uh, it's part of how to make the deal happen. And so we've been helping him manage that group anyway for two years now to, to make this deal go through. And um, I've got one full-time employee. and. Uh, my wife and kids are big help, but she has a veterinary uh, rehabilitation business that's bigger and <laughs> more going on there. So she's off uh, fixing horses. <laughs> Bruce, you talked about not worming your cows and, and even your calves. Um, do you feel like it's your movement and it's the, are you moving your cattle enough that you feel like you're getting in front of that worm cycle? And also, I think a matter of probably nutrition and I think that's it. Yeah. Uh huh. And do you, but do you have a percentage of your cows that'll fall out because of did you think rough hair coat? Um, 
Right. Discoloration, just mark all the conditions like the other channels. There still is a percentage, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. You're We're just letting your environment sort that. Yeah. And and we'll I mean we'll treat an animal however it needs to be treated. Right. And um and we'll make a note. It's got a mark against it and it could go to the sale barn or whatever needs to happen. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you.